Hey guys, in this video I want to tell you everything I've learned about taking better photos of family and friends. If you were to ask me what kind of photographer I am, my answer would be documentary photographer. But the truth is, it's really hard for me and also to Danae to specialize. We just love taking photos of everything. And though social media superstars will say you really have to specialize and that your Instagram page needs to look consistent and the pros will tell you they have to specialize or you'll just never make it, I just can't do it. There are just too many things that I love to photograph and um, I just can't see myself settling into one thing and focusing on it. But at the end of the day, the photographs that matter the most to me are the photos that document the journey of life. 30 years from now, I'm not gonna care at all about the fashion shoots I did. It'll be the photos of my kids when they were young or, or photos of loved ones or pets when they were still alive that will really matter. So to me, this is the absolute most important area of photography that I'm interested in improving. Now, I don't wanna patronize you. I do get tired just like you of all of the how to take better photos, articles, and videos. And I really debated making this video, but there are actually a few key things that I've learned that I feel like aren't talked about as much in some of the articles I've read on the subject of family life photography. So hopefully wherever you are on your journey, there will be at least something here that you hadn't considered, hopefully. So at the risk of annoying some people, I have decided that I do want to share with you my eight tips for better domestic documentary photography. In the corner of our kitchen area, we have a small photo wall that has become a sort of designated place for all the candid documentary style moments that we capture. I actually have a setup so it will remain sort of timeless. I can always update a photo to keep this wall current. The square crop in the black and white format means that no matter when I decide to update a photo, it can just fit right in and not appear out of place, regardless of how our color grading styles might change or evolve through the years, or regardless of what aspect ratio the original photo is taken. These are also high quality acrylic prints with metallic coating, and I just really love the look. But when I look at these photos, especially the ones I really love, most of these photos would never have happened if I decided to listen to that little voice in my head that said, Psst, hey, you don't need to take your camera out, you're just going to the park, dude. Or like some of these photos, which were at the museum, which has horrible lighting conditions. I'm really glad I didn't listen to that voice or some of my favorite photos just never would have happened. But the principle isn't just to have a camera with you everywhere you go, it's also to keep a camera with you in easy reach at home. If your camera is in a camera bag in the closet, I guarantee you will miss some of the best moments that can happen around the home. So that's really one of my tips, but I know I, know I promised you that I would talk less about the aspects of family documentary photography that are obvious, but we had to talk about that tip before the next one. So, Having done that, let's talk about tip number two, which is to always be aware. This is the one tip you almost never hear, but I'm absolutely convinced it makes the biggest difference between really good photographers and average photographers or even just really bad photographers. Poor or inexperienced photographers only take shots when a shot is obvious, when a scene just hits them over the head, or when they've gone through great lengths to arrange a shot. You just hike the mountain, what do you do? You take a photo of the family in front of the view. You just drive to Paris after 24 hours flight, what do you do? You take a photo in front of the Eiffel Tower. You want a photo of your kids on the first day of school, what do you do? You line them up on the front porch and you have them hold up a sign that says what grade they're in. But the best photographers, they're constantly aware of what is surrounding them. They think about photography when they don't have to think about anything. While going through their daily lives, there's some small portion of their brain, some sub-process dedicated to analyzing the scene. It's always aware of potential subjects and how the light is hitting them. It's aware of contrast and negative space. It's aware of rhythm and variation, principles of hierarchy and composition, and in some cases it may not even have terms for all those things, but it is the part of your brain that will know how to make a strong photo that has deeper meaning. And if something jumps out as being something that has potential, maybe it's a potential landscape scene, or a decisive moment on the street, or more relevant to what we're talking about here today, a significant moment happening in your life or the life of a loved one and in good lighting conditions, your brain brings that up to your conscious level, and if you've got easy access to a camera, you're in a position to act on it. So, the big question is, how do you get your brain to the point where it's working for you all the time? And the answer is actually very simple. It's back to tip number one. This is where tip number one of keeping your camera on you at all times and tip number two of awareness come together. I know that if I have a camera I'm aware of, I'm also going to be aware of what's happening around me. If it's a little inconvenient, chances are you're not gonna forget why it's there. If you're like me, you need that reminder around your neck that no matter what you're doing, you've got a job to do, and it's amazing how well it works. 
So when it comes to what camera you choose to put around your neck, I suggest the size makes a huge difference. While a full frame camera with a massive 1.2 aperture lens will give you some face melting vocalization, thinking about it realistically, is that a camera you're going to keep on you for a family picnic or a 20 mile hike? It's probably unlikely. Remember, the size of your camera is directly proportional to the amount of time it will be on your person. And also consider that it's not just a matter of convenience. Having a large camera can draw attention to you and makes it much more likely that you'll be too self-conscious to have it at social gatherings or outings. For instance, going out to dinner, or more commonly for me is at the park. This may come as a shocker to you, but I don't like taking a huge camera with a massive lens with me when I visit the park with my kids. Nothing says pedo creeper guy quite like a 5D Mark IV with a 70 to 200 2.8 lens. It's also a bit harder to be up close and present with my kids with that massive of hardware around my neck. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, that's what my smartphone is for. And yes, smartphones can really take incredible photos these days. Certainly I've got some that I really love when I didn't have anything else with me. And while yes, cameras should be convenient, it shouldn't be too convenient. So convenient that you forget that it's with you. Should you use a smartphone for real photography? Yes, by all means use them. But if you find yourself forgetting to document your life simply because it's out of sight, out of mind, keep something a little less convenient around your neck at all times. And by the way, one other thing that I found that is helpful is to have a camera I'm excited about. Gas is one thing, and I'm a big believer in spending wisely and being responsible, but if you love the way your camera looks and feels, if it brings you joy just in the act of using it, you'll be that much more likely to want to have it with you when you're headed out of the house. So keep that in mind. But on the other hand, we have tip number three, which is that story is more important than medium. For a while, I suffered from this issue of not wanting to use my phone to photograph interesting things around me because I had invested thousands of dollars into my professional kit. And if that kit was back at home, at some strange level in my mind, it felt wrong to pull out something so inferior. The thought of editing files off my smartphone side by side with my superior raw shots created with this really high-end gear just sounded abhorrent to me. Now be honest with yourself. Is that ever you? Do you ever sort of check out or give your photographic brain a break just because you're stuck with only a smartphone? Today's a really good example for me here. She doesn't have any sort of arrogance when it comes to what gear she uses. She also has taught me that capturing the moment is what matters most. She actually shoots with her phone far more than she does with our Fuji. So for Christmas, I got her this little guy, the 58 millimeter moment lens. She loves taking portraits and she really loves the more portrait lens focal lengths. And she loves being able to post that instantly for friends and grandparents without any fuss. So this really has been the best photographic gift I could have given her. But the thing about it is that when it's attached to the phone, it does create a little bit of inconvenience. And that reminder, again, that awareness that you have a job to do. And so I'd say it's a pretty good solution for some folks. But even more than that, I, th I really think a lot of photographers just refuse to use a smartphone because it's almost like they're admitting they didn't really need all that expensive gear that's sitting back at home. Swallow that pride, take out that phone, and remember story, good composition, good lighting, and right emotion. All of those elements can make a bigger difference to your photography, arguably, in some instances, than your camera choice. Tip number four, whatever your gear, know it well. Moments are so fleeting. You just have to know how to use your devices. For instance, what is the default mode? Like with a film camera, that shuttercock preparing for the next frame. Uh, digital cameras have a reset. You kind of have to think about resetting between shots so you're not surprised when next you pick up that device. A good example of this is an old trick for those of you who, like me, occasionally shoot with manual focus lenses. After taking a shot, get in the habit of resetting the lens back to infinity focus. Focus. That way you know where it is when you go to focus for the next shot. Also, if you're focusing infinity, it's easier to bring into focus subjects that are moving towards you, which is more often what you're trying to capture rather than subjects moving away from you. If you shoot a lot with your phone, know how to bring the camera app up quickly from the off mode of your camera. Hopefully you know how to do that. Most phones have a quick way of bringing up that camera without unlocking the phone. Create some muscle memory around that so there's no wasted time. And with your digital cameras, when you finished a shoot and you yank that memory card out, get in the habit of resetting everything to either a known default or just stick everything into auto, including the white balance. Doing so will save you from missing or messing up shots next time you pick it up. For a while, I would grab a camera and miss a really cool opportunity around the house because it was 
midday and my camera settings were set up for low light, like I'd been shooting the night before or something, and the wrong white balance. I just didn't have time to get all the settings right and still catch that moment. So now that I have that reset habit where everything just goes back into auto in between shoots, that helps ensure I won't miss a moment if I'm in a hurry next time. But that leads to my next tip, which is to not be too proud to shoot with some or all settings in auto mode. Missing a shot because only noobs shoot in auto mode is a terrible excuse. This is a lie some photographers tell to distinguish themselves or to establish legitimacy. Of course, you should know how your camera works and how to balance an exposure and depth of field using the full manual features that your camera has. But if you miss shots because you are too deep in a menu or fussing about with a dial and the moment passed by, that doesn't prove anything anything to anyone other than that living up to some false notion about what real photographers do was more important to you than actually getting the shot. If you're worried about impressing people, then stop missing good shots. Don't get caught up in what real photographers shoot with or what settings they use. Just get the shot. Tip number six, you don't have to photograph every step of the journey. Some people want to take selfies or group shots in front of every single interesting thing they see, but these photos suck. Nobody likes to look at them. They don't tell any sort of story and it's lazy photography. Now to be clear, I'm not saying don't photograph the landmarks. Sense of place can be very important in sharing the full story of an adventure or tying a moment to a memory, but don't beat people over the head with it. Guys, think of it this way. You're not trying to create a logbook. What you're trying to create is a poem. Great poets are not literal and they don't have a lot of words to work with. A poet is trying to capture the essence of a message in only a few carefully crafted rhythmic and pleasing phrases. A good poem doesn't beat us over the head with a message rarely are the words literal and most of the time they say a lot more with less. Treat photography the same way. Use a small number of photos to capture the emotion of a full journey. Take photos that matter, that are interesting for more reasons than just to log a certain person was in a certain place. Look for ways to tell a story in more than just a literal way. For instance, photograph the trappings or the details of a journey. Use negative space to create isolation look for and anticipate emotional moments. If you're being more selective, you'll also be anticipating. If you're so caught up in catching everything, you'll end up with a lot of mediocre shots. But if you can have a sharp awareness for and anticipate the magic moments, the few photos you come away with will mean much, much more. Opening presents, for example. Don't try to document every gift unwrapped at Christmas, birthdays, or other celebrations. Try to know ahead of time which of those moments are gonna really matter and be ready to capture those moments. Or be ready to react to those micro emotions, those little sweet subtle moments between loved ones that you might otherwise miss if you're too busy asking Molly to hold up her brand new My Little Pony doll and smile big for the camera. That doesn't mean take less photos, but maybe it does mean being more selective about what we point our camera at. And it certainly means being more selective about what photos we decide are keepers. To be a better photographer, you've got to become a better editor. A documentary photographer takes hundreds or thousands of photos on location, but usually only very few are printed. Your audience doesn't have time, patience, or interest in reviewing your logbook. But if you can capture a small slice of real, meaningful story that can sum up or convey what your adventure or memory really meant at the time to you, that will mean much more to an observer and to your future self than just about anything else you do. My next tip is to bring more interest into your shots. Newer photographers seem to have an obsession with shallow depth of field because it's an important way for them to begin to separate themselves from other people who are not photographers. It's a very simple way to create separation between the background and a subject, and there's something about it that newer photographers find captivating. And I'll admit, I was there for a while also. Don't get me wrong, a blurry background can be an important tool for composition and look really great to some people. But just as with learning a new language, try to expand your photography vocabulary by using other ways to create emotion, meaning, and to bring to the eye what it is you want your viewers to see. Additionally, don't just photograph the interesting things that happen. Compose it. Be aware of what's around it. Can you separate the subject from the background by moving a few feet one way or the other to find a better contrast? Will the light be better from the other side? Can you frame the subject somehow? Can you introduce some sort of interest in the foreground? Can you work with the shadows to try to bring focus or direct the eye to 
a point of interest? Can you find some leading lines? Are there some elements that are too bright or colorful that they will distract? If so, can you compose them out of your shot? By thinking this way long enough, your brain will work its way through these questions in milliseconds. In short, be aware of all the elements surrounding your subject and embrace them. Deal with them as much as you can. Don't completely obliterate them by always blurring everything into oblivion. It will make you lazy and you'll miss opportunities to bring more sense of place into your photos. Tip number eight, don't beat yourself up when you miss shots. If you allow yourself to dwell on missed moments, photography will quickly turn into something that's stressful and become a negative thing. I'm sure we can all think back to moments that we regret not capturing, but the only real way forward here is to rejoice in the moments you are able to catch and accept and learn from the moments that you don't. But if you're doing that, your ability will improve. Let the frustration and doubt be replaced by a focus and renewed anticipation for the next moment. But you do need a plan to improve. If you don't take action, you will keep making the same mistakes and that will lead to more missed shots. When I was learning, I kept making the same few mistakes. Things like having the white balance set wrong or not realizing that the ISO was still set to 3600 from a previous night shoot or shooting with too shallow a depth of field for a group shot. These can be frustrating mistakes. To overcome them, in addition to resetting everything to auto mode, like I said before, I would also place a sticky note on the back of my camera that was written the thing that I was trying to approve and I would keep that on there until that technique or the awareness of that setting was beginning to become second nature. Another way to work on this is to actually practice. Consider that taking lots and lots of photos at times when you don't think it matters that much or you're not really likely to capture anything interesting can actually be one of the best times to take photos. It gives you a low stress and controlled moment to improve your art and to better master your tools. For more suggestions here, take a look at a video I did for anyone who has ever said the words, I don't have time for photography. But that leads to my final tip, and that is that when you do miss shots, it can be really tempting to try to manipulate the scene or try to recreate what you might have missed. My final tip is to not do that. If your kid just did something cool and you missed it because your camera was in the other room, you may be tempted to run and grab the camera and try to get them to do it again. But if you are too overbearing or you do this too often, your children will start to resent the camera and you. It can also create negative association if you're always stressed and trying to coerce a certain pose or smile out of them. It can make the whole process stressful to you as well. And you may begin to associate negative emotions like frustration and impatience and judgment into your photography. In short, if you missed the moment, accept that you missed it. Enjoy the moment for the joy that it brought you and go get your camera so that you're ready for the next time something interesting happens. Unless it's someone's deathbed, you'll always have more moments to look forward to. In addition to that, I would advise you, especially with kids, don't take portraits unless it's an actual portrait shoot. If you're always trying to get your kids to look at you and smile, they will soon learn to hate your camera and this will lead to a lifelong issue for them. Trust me, as portrait photographers, Danae and I deal with your kids when they are all growing up and they have camera complexes because you made it a negative experience for them. Stop doing it. But beyond that, the best photos, the ones that you really value the most, really are the ones that happen naturally. I like the analogy of Ugwe from Kung Fu Panda. You can't force a seed to grow. All you can do is prepare the environment for it to grow. Something like that. So, spend time with your loved ones. Try to be with them at interesting locations and in good lighting. Influence them softly, never demand a pose out of them. And be observant and prepared. And don't get in the way, or worse, try to control what life is bringing to you. Adapt to the scene, anticipate the scene, accept whatever comes to you, and know that the best photographs are in front of you, not behind. Okay, well that's all my advice. I really do hope you found something in there that was valuable. If so, you can thank me by sending me money or by subscribing. One of those two things, whichever is easier. Bye.